Good afternoon, everybody. My name is TJ Pempel. I'm the director of the Institute of East Asian Studies here at UC Berkeley, one of the co-sponsors of today's activities and the entire uh, elegant gathering. I want to welcome you on behalf of myself and the Institute, and thank you all for coming. I'd also like to just say how excited we are to be helping to put together this exciting conference, the Elegant Gathering, as I'm sure many of you know, is historically uh, a Chinese activity that involves the meeting of great intellectuals for the sharing of poetics, uh, literature, rumor, and food. And whether you want to bring all of these with you at the end of uh, today's performance or discussion or not, I don't know. But there is a reception that will take place after our guest speaker, to which all of you are invited. And you can at least dip your toe into the potentials for an elegant gathering. Uh, I want to thank uh, the Asian Art Museum, particularly uh, uh, the people at the Asian Art Museum for putting together the exhibit, and the people here at the Berkeley Art Museum, particularly Michael Knight and Pauline Yao, who worked very hard to make today's activities and events uh, possible. I'd also like to thank uh, Professor Wen Xin Ye of the Center for Chinese Studies and also of the History Department here at Berkeley, as well as the Zhang Jingguo Foundation for their financial support. All of these individuals, as well as, of course, the Asian Art Museum, uh, played a critical role in bringing the collection from the Ye family to San Francisco. And I hope all of you have the opportunity to experience not only the conference here, but also the exhibit over on the other side of the bay. Uh, with that brief set of introductory remarks, let me turn the program over to Michael Knight from uh, the museum. Thank you. Okay, so I need to go through here and check off all the things that I don't have to say. That was nicely done. Thank you. Uh, I'm Michael Knight. I'm the Senior Curator of Chinese Art at the Asian Art Museum, and I'm also the Deputy Director of Strategic Programs and Partnerships, whatever that means. <clears throat> and certainly one of our best partnerships that we have right now is with the, uh, here at the University of California, Berkeley, and the Institute of East Asian Studies, Wen Xin. Jeffrey Regal, um, who's here, I think, uh, actually ran our whole docent program this, this year in the, in the fall, the fall series. And we had the greatest series of speakers that we've ever had coming through the museum, people that he brought and organized to bring here. I didn't have to do it. He did it all, and it was great, and I got to go and listen at least to some of the lectures. <coughs> he also brought a group of uh, very important archaeologists from Xi'an who came here uh, just not too long ago. And again, a wonderful opportunity for people to come in, do things here, but also come to the museum and look at our objects. I learned more about some of the bronzes that I've been dealing with for years and years and years in that kind of one-day session than I have learned in a long, long time. So this is a partnership that has great value to us, and I hope it continues to develop and grow. <coughs> uh, this, is, this symposium, this gathering, is in honor of the exhibition, The Elegant Gathering, The Ye Family Collection, which will be on view now until September 17th of this year. We have a rotation. We have a first group of paintings and calligraphy up now. We have a rotation coming in the later part of June. So it's worth, certainly, I hope you do all come over, and it's worth making a second visit kind of early in July on into September. The exhibition itself is made possible by the generous support of Akiko Yamazaki and Jerry Yang, Christine Johnson and Tim Dattels, and these things are important for me, so please bear with me. Wells Fargo, United Airlines, the Beishan Tang Foundation, the John Jingua Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Blakemore Foundation. I spent more time writing grants than I did writing the catalog. The collection was put together over approximately 100-year period by three members of the Ye family, which originally came from Panyu and Guangdong province. And let me give you a very, very brief background about some of, the, of those family members. <coughs> the first is Ye Yenlan, who lived from 1823 to 1898. He passed his Juren degree in 1852 and his Jinshu in 1856. He had a long and successful career as an official in the Qing Imperial bureaucracy. Served in the Hanan Academy as an official in the Ministry of Revenue in Shandong Province, as a director of a governmental bureau in Jiangxi Province, as vice director of a bureau in Guizhou Province, as gentleman of the interior in Yunnan Province, and as secretary in the Council of State Office for Military Affairs. After retirement, he spent his later years in Panyu and lectured at the Yuehua Institute of Literature. 
He was a noted collector and also a very skilled calligrapher and painting and a member of a number of local painting and artistic societies. His grandson was Yagong Chua, and Kui Yi Shun, I hope you're all coming to the session tomorrow because Kui Yi Shun will be giving a, a presentation about him. And anything that I would have to say here, Kui Yi can say a whole lot better. But let me give you a very, very brief kind of uh, summation of his uh, bio as well. He was Ye Yanlan's grandson, and like his grandfather, was educated in a traditional Chinese system. He placed first in the imperial sponsored exam in Guangdong in 1898, so very near the end of the chain. He went on to have a fascinating and challenging career as a government official, both in the late Qing bureaucracy and also during the early Republican era. He was a very close confidant of Sun Yat-sen and is actually buried uh, next to Sun Yat-sen in Nanjing. He left the government official service in, in 1928 and following his retirement, he was very active in cultural activities and educational reform. Uh, the one that's perhaps most important for us here in San Francisco or certainly for the Asian Art Museum is in October 1933, he was appointed to take charge of establishing the Shanghai Museum and became the first chairman of that museum's board of trustees. That's our sister institution in China. Yagong Chao is the next of the major players. He lived from 1904 to 1981. <coughs> he was Yagong Chua's nephew and Ye Yanlan's grandson, and certainly was one of China's most visible international spokespersons during the middle decades of the 20th century. He was born in 1904 in Jiangxi province, where his father was governor of Zhejiang Prefect. His father died when Gong Chao was nine, and Gong Chao went to live with his uncle, that's Ye Gong Chua. He began to attend schools in the West at age 10 and ultimately received a degree in literature at Amherst College, where he studied poetry with Robert Fa Frost and published a vol volume of poems in English under Frost's direction. He received his Master of Arts at Cambridge and then returned to China to pursue a career as a university, university professor, writer, and editor. He entered China's Foreign Service during the Sino-Japanese War and served as Foreign Minister for the Republic of China from 1950 to 1958. From 1958 to 1961, he served as ambassador to the United States, and in 1961, uh, due to some interesting differences with the ruling members of the government of the Republic, he was forced into retirement and spent the remainder of his time basically under house arrest. Yagong Chua was involved in a variety of art organizations and important cultural events. In 1961, he fin finalized negotiations with institutions in the United States to mount a special traveling exhibition of selected art treasures from the National Palace Museum. That exhibition came to San Francisco in 1962. It's certainly one of the groundbreaking exhibitions of Chinese art of that period. <coughs> Gong Chao was a noted, noted for his skills as a calligrapher and painter, um, basically of orchids, bamboos, and rocks. And he was an avid collector with a particular interest in Chinese calligraphy. And that's a lot of what you'll see uh, as you go over to view our exhibition. <coughs> The collection itself was presented to the Asian Art Museum by Gong Chao's children, uh, Max Ye and his sister, Ye Tong. Max is here with his daughter this evening, and Ye Tong, I believe, will be joining us at some point along the, along the way. There are 135 works in the collection, uh, kind of half of them collected works, and the others done by either members of the family or members of their artistic circles. The symposium, that's the next two days this evening and all day tomorrow, was, uh, as you now know, jointly organized by the Institute of East Asian Studies and the Asian Art Museum. It was funded by a generous grant from the Zhang Jingguo Foundation and supported by the Center for Chinese Studies here at UC Berkeley. So with that, let me go on to introducing our keynote speaker tonight, who's Jonathan Hay, who received his PhD in 1989 from Yale University and is now an endowed professor of fine arts at the Institute of Fine Arts, New York. At NYU, excuse me. His research focuses on issues of modernity and visual culture in China. His publications include Shi Tao, Painting and Modernity in Early Qing China, and is currently working on a new book, Sensuous Surfaces, Decoration in 18th and, 19th, and 17th and 18th Century China. Jonathan's topic for the evening is the effects of imperial collecting on the transmission of Chinese painting. Good evening. Well, thank you all for coming. Very nice of you to come. Uh, it's wonderful for me to be back in a room where I've speak, spoken before and you know, really with very great pleasure. I love Berkeley and uh, nice to see old friends. But it's really uh, a, a particular honor to be speaking at the beginning 
of a symposium celebrating the, the gift of the collection of the Ye family um, to the Asian Art Museum. It's a fascinating collection. I haven't been able to see the original works yet, but I've been able to see the catalog. Can't wait to see the works later on today and tomorrow. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a collection of depth. I don't, I, I don't mean so much in terms of the objects, but in terms of the thinking that underlies the formation of the collection. We have a wonderful catalog of it, which is available in the, book in the bookstore upstairs with uh, terrific essays, among which I particularly want to single out the introductory essay by Max Ye, um, about which I'm going to say a little more uh, later on in this uh, talk. It's a very subtle piece of work, and I recommend it uh, to you. It's worth buying the catalog for that essay alone. Um, I've been asked to uh, speak for about 45 minutes, and I will try to keep to that. Now, I realize that I didn't give my essay a very, uh, my talk a very sexy title, and these are not very sexy images that are on the screen, but the topic really is a very important one and uh, has many aspects of great interest. Imperial collections, uh, the imperial collecting of paintings and of artworks more generally is very familiar to almost everybody in this room, I'm sure. It, uh, it's today associated with the two great collections of the National Palace Museum in Taipei and the, uh, the Palace Museum in uh, Beijing. And those two collections have inherited the former imperial collections of the, uh, the Qing dynasty. But rulers and uh, emperors in particular have amassed uh, collections of paintings in China for, long, for as long as painting has existed. And we're really talking here about a history of almost 2,000 years. And what kind of, if we're going to simply talk about uh, paintings, which is my uh, specialty, I don't feel competent to talk about calligraphy, then it's probably worth noting that the, the types of uh, paintings we'll be concerned with are portable paintings. But before I get to that, let me point out what's on the screen. Uh, on the left is a map of the, uh, the palace precinct, the 11th century palace precinct of the, uh, the Song capital of uh, Kaifeng. And on the right is uh, a detail from a painting uh, now in the Palace Museum, in the National Palace Museum in Taipei, uh, from about uh, 1007, which depicts the emperor of the day, Junzong, uh, examining books in the Imperial Library. Now, the Imperial Library was also a repository for paintings, which is why I'm showing it here. Now, portable paintings, it's important to say that, Portable paintings, because we're not talking, I'm not going to be talking today very much about murals, wall painting, which was the most important format of pre Song Dynasty China, sometimes called medieval China, China uh, before the uh, 10th, 10th century, um, a period that will come very much into today's talk. Instead, we'll be talking about uh, screens, scrolls, albums, and eventually. Uh, Bands. Now, why is the portability important? Well, because uh, these were paintings that were not t tied to a physical site, which could be uh, brought together uh, to constitute their own ideal site, a sort of conceptual site, we might say, that breaks with the normal laws of geography and history. And one of the things I'm going to be one of the themes I'll be coming back to is that this, the site constituted by an imperial collection was always uh, provisional. Collections, imperial collections um, were repositories of cultural capital, a capital that was uh, translatable into political capital as <coughs> legitimacy uh, to possess uh, uh, an imperial collection of paintings of different periods was to lay claim to an important part of the Chinese uh, cultural heritage. 
Now, obviously, this is not simply applicable to uh, imperial collections, the collections of the, um, the educated elite uh, functioned on this model too. And in Maxia's essay, there is a, a wonderful discussion of this. And one of the points that he makes is that uh, his father's uh, collection, the collection uh, or the, the way that his father practiced collecting, collecting that's Ye Gong Chao, was not devoid of political... Uh, meaning. Um, and uh, so he talks about uh, the networking, the, its significance for networking, for example, um, during his later career in, in Taiwan. And I, one of the reasons why I recommend this essay to you is because it is not an easy celebration uh, of, of a collection that just happened to exist, but it is really an attempt to understand that collection. And any celebration that it gives is, is really earned. Now, in modern times, um, collection, imperial collections, or the, uh, the imperial collections as they have survived um, and as they have passed into the, the hands of the different states, um, also function this way. Uh, the National Palace Museum collection, for example, can be seen as a kind of shadow palace um, which preserves, in a certain sense, the, the essence of the, the, the Gogong, of the, of the Forbidden City in Beijing. We, we get the, uh, the, the yi, if not the shi, the, the idea of it, if not the material you know, outside frame that would be given uh, by the architecture. The imperial collecting of painting is a, a macro-historical phenomenon, as I was saying, over close to 2,000 years. Now, independently of the, the personal involvement of specific rulers, there were certain rec recurrent patterns governing the means of acquisition. Emperors um, appointed agents, for example, who were uh, entrusted with the job of scouring the country to... Um, to, to find works that would be worthy of the imperial collection. Another means of bringing a collection together was to involve the provincial bureaucracy. And the, the, the bureaucracy sometimes took the, uh, uh, the initiative itself uh, in order to uh, curry favor um, with superiors and eventually uh, with the emperor. And in later times, we have inventories that... Uh, talk about the, uh, that give us lists of paintings that were sent to uh, the court. The ruler or the emperor could also uh, confiscate important paintings. And uh, for that reason, uh, collectors, private collectors, were often very loath to uh, mention uh, the existence of uh, paintings that they owned. Uh, sometimes private collectors would spontaneously um, send in paintings as tribute, so to speak, again, to, to, to gain favor. And then one final way in which uh, I may be missing out various means of acquisition, but one final very important way in which uh, imperial collections were put together was as war booty. When uh, uh, a new dynasty came to power, it often uh, was able to uh, take over the collection of a prior dynasty. I'm showing you on the right a painting uh, which is now in the Palace Museum in Beijing, which uh, uh, depicts the Emperor Taizong of the, of the Tang Dynasty, uh, who reigned in the first half of, during the first half of the 7th century. Here he's greeting Tibetan uh, envoys on a matter of a, a, a diplomatic uh, marriage. Um, and on the, the uh, left uh, a calligraphy, a rubbing of a calligraphy uh, by Taizong himself. Um, uh, and let us bear in mind that Chinese emperors, um, we, we tend to think in the West, we tend to associate rulers with their, uh, their image, their physical image. And that's because we have a tradition of coins 
going back uh, thousands of years now. But uh, in, in China, the image of the emperor was disseminated not through pictorial means, but rather through calligraphy. So it was rather important that uh, emperors be able to, uh, to, to write. And then steles were carved and, uh, and, and, re and uh, rubbings uh, served as a means of reproduction. Now, the institutional history of imperial collections is, is far too complicated for me to discuss here, not least because I'm so ignorant about it. It's, it has all the complexity of everything that involves uh, Chinese bureaucracy. <laughs> and those people who are experts on its history are, you know, are brave people who have worked on it for a very long time. And I don't, I, I, I don't want to um, get tangled up in that. I would rather make a few points regarding a more per personal dimension of the, the, the people who were involved in the imperial collections, a personal dimension that they brought, a personal investment that they had. And there were I, I want to focus on two kinds of person. One is the, the emperor, and the other is, uh, would be a, a group of people who I'm going to refer to as the imperial curators, though that, of course, is a modern term. Well, the emperors first. A remarkable number of emperors engaged in artistic activity them, themselves, writing calligraphy, of course, but also uh, often uh, painting too. Another of uh, Max Yeh's subtle insights is that collecting may be important because it precedes artistic creation. That it's a, collecting is a condition for artistic production. And that certainly has to be borne in mind here. The imperial painting collection was often available for study by court artists and in a sense made court painting possible as court planning. But what one sometimes forgets is that uh, the emperor himself often took the lead in this. Not necessarily by painting himself, though many did, but by taking collecting and art criticism and connoisseurship seriously. This is a remarkable, to me, a remarkable feature of the imperial institution in, in China. And I'm showing you these two images related to the Tang Emperor uh, Taizong, because, not just because he was a calligrapher, but because he was um, uh, deeply involved with uh, collecting and with the, uh, the, pr the promotion of the visual arts in his time. And as part of that, um, uh, now he, he recognized and he uh, took advantage of the potential personal investment of scholar officials in the imperial collection. This is where I get to imperial curators. So in the year six, uh, 632, he directed uh, an official, Chu Sui Liang, um, uh, an example of whose calligraphy you see on the left, together with another famous calligrapher of the time, uh, Yu Shinan, to review the imperial collection of paintings and calligraphy, not just calligraphies, but also paintings. So this was a case where bureaucrats with real competence, real aesthetic competence, were appointed as curators. But the bureaucratic curator, if I could uh, give, give him that name, was not always so competent. For example, we, due to the, the work of the Japanese scholar Kohara uh, Hironobu, we know quite a lot now about the formation of the Qianlong collection between, from 1736 uh, onwards, Emperor Qianlong's collection. And uh, what Kohara has shown is that those, the, the, the curators, who were initially entrusted with cataloging that collection were really quite at sea at the beginning. They were, uh, some of them were barely competent and had to uh, learn on the job. And of course, nowadays, we, if we see a work that has been through that 18th century imperial collection, we assume that you know, this is a great thing. What we forget is that a great many spurious works entered the collection and partly that was to do with the limited talents of, of, of certain curators who were appointed on 
in a way, on, uh, on social grounds, because they were not artisans, because they were part of the, 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 the scholar elite. So there was a, a range of uh, competencies among, among those curators. The other, at the other end of the scale, there was a, a different model, followed uh, much more rarely, as far as I can see, which was to appoint court painters as curators. And here I'm showing you one of those uh, artists, a, Huang, a painting by one of those artists, Huang Juce, uh, on the right, uh, active in the late uh, 10th century uh, at the, the Song Dynasty court. And this practice of employing court painters as, as curators of the imperial painting collection was much more common in the 9th and 10th centuries than it was uh, later on. Today, we know Huang Juce as a court painter above all, uh, the son of another court painter, Huang Quan, um, who in late life worked at the Song Dynasty court, um, like his son, but uh, who had earlier uh, been a, court pa a painter at the court of the kingdom of Shu in uh, West China, which you can see. Uh, whoops. The other direction. I'm, I'm killing myself here. <laughs> <laughs> if I were a plane, I'd be. <laughs> um, and so we're dealing with a, a Sichuanese artist here. The father, Huang Chuan, famous painting uh, by him, a study of birds, which was actually done uh, for his son to uh, help him study how to paint. Now, although we know Huang Zhu Cai uh, on the right there as a court painter, he was also employed by the Song Emperor Taizong, not the Tang Emperor, the Song Taizong, not Tang Taizong, in the late 970s and 980s to canvas the population in general for pictures, as an 11th century text puts it, and to authenticate the paintings that came into the imperial collection. Now, that late 10th century emperor was probably influenced by the fact that in the kingdom of Shu, uh, painters had sometimes served as commissioners for the uh, storehouse or repository of paintings, in other words, as cu curators of the painting collection. And the father, Huang Chuan, on the left here, had in fact been a deputy commissioner of the, um, the, imperial, of the, uh, the, the storehouse of paintings. In later times, that's to say after the 10th century, the artisan background of court artists seems to have counted against them. And um, down the centuries, from after, after this point, um, it seems to have been important that, that one came from the uh, scholar official elite. Now having formed the collection, or having formed a collection, the emperor and his curators contributed to the historical transmission of paintings in a number of ways. I mean, first of all, by giving the physical artifact the attention it deserved, uh, by repairing and remounting it as, as necessary. That's, uh, I mean, uh, it's obvious that imperial, uh, that, that the court had resources at its disposal for this that um, were uh, often outstanding. A second contribution was made by uh, copying. And on the screen, you see a copy of uh, an 8th century painting attributed to the artist Zhang Xuan, um, which was a, a copy that was made at the early 12th century court of the Song Emperor uh, Huizong. The impulse for these copies, or the impulse behind these copies, must often have come from the degraded physical condition of the original work. Now today, uh, I'm, it occurred to me as I was uh, preparing this talk that today uh, we clean the Sistine Chapel and now we can see Michelangelo's paintings as people in the 19th century or the 18th century couldn't possibly have, have seen them. We've restored their splendor in that way. But at the early 12th century court of Huizong, an 8th century painting attributed to Zhang Xuan was revealed in its approximate original splendor. I've, that's the title to it there on the right. Let me give you a detail now. 
was revealed in its approximate original splendor through the efforts of a copyist. And I think there may be uh, a limited analogy here to the refurbishment of um, important buildings, palace buildings and temple buildings. Um, it's an idea of reincarnation. The work reincarnates itself through, through its copy. In this context, it's probably worth noting that Song Dynasty texts on painting, um, by and large, don't distinguish uh, between a copy and an autograph original. I mean, there are exceptions to this rule, but it, it, the rule of thumb is that the, the, you know, if you say, if some, if a collection has such and such a Tang painting, you don't know whether they thought it was the autograph original or, or just a copy. The, ma the important thing was that it was the composition and some approximation of the original colors and brushwork. Our modern attachment to authenticity as an, an autograph matter is not generally operative at that time, though it would have been for some. We might want to remind ourselves here that in early 18th century England, um, copies of Italian Renaissance paintings did not have the, the uh, low status that they have for us today, but they were rather seen um, as uh, not just stand-ins for the original, but they somehow were the original. So we have to beware a little of our, our modern uh, uh, thinking ab ab about copies when we look at a work such as the one on the screen. There was another reason for making copies, um, which was to preserve mural paintings. Um, Mural paintings uh, were often painted over or uh, destroyed. And so a copy um, became a way not only of preserving a composition that would otherwise disappear, but it was also a way of introducing the large-scale format of uh, wall painting or murals into the ideal site represented by the imperial collection of, of portable paintings. And what I'm showing you here is uh, a painting from the, uh, probably from around the early 13th century and end of the 12th, early 13th century, um, which uh, w was done at the Southern Sung Court and which preserves a mural from around the very beginning of uh, the 11th century. A third contribution of imperial collecting to the transmission of paintings was through the catalogs that were uh, compiled in certain dynasties. Many of you know, of course, the Xuanhe Huapu, which is the catalog of the early, early 12th century painting, early 12th century collection of the Emperor Huizong, which is relatively short compared to the Shichu Baozi, uh, compiled over decades. Um, uh, to um, uh, record the Qianlong Imperial Collection and the, the Jiaqing Collection uh, in the, the second half of the 18th century. And these catalogs, particularly Shi Chu Baoji, are, are fundamental documentary uh, resources. Um, in fact, on we, today, art historians depend on, on both. Were we to be talking about calligraphy as well, were I to be bringing that into the discussion, I would have to say that a further contribution of imperial uh, collecting uh, was the sponsorship of um, uh, the transfer of original calligraphies into stone form, um, to have them carved into stone, which then allowed uh, rubbings to be made for them. It's a, an early form of reproduction, which has been uh, remarkably persistent in, in, in Chinese and effective in, in Chinese history. Art historians are so glad to have any evidence for pre-modern painting, particularly painting for the period before the 12th century or so, that we, we often pass over the downsides of imperial collecting. 
Of course, as many of us here know, there's a conspicuous exception to this blindness. You will probably, many of you already have heard or have participated in the criticism of the Emperor Qianlong's inscriptions on uh, Chinese paintings. Here, uh, I believe that all of these inscriptions are by the Emperor Qianlong. <laughs> um, and they're often described as graffiti. Um, but this is, this is really a rather compl complicated question. Um, there's a, there, whether we like it or not, there's a certain uh, dialogue uh, going on here between the, uh, the Qing emperor and the great Ming cultural figure, uh, Dong Qichang, painting uh, uh, in the early 17th century. There's a clash between political and cultural economies of power taking place on this scroll. And one might, if one wanted to look at this differently, one might want to bear in mind that sometimes it, it, that there's perhaps an analogy here to the way that um, the criticism that gets to the heart of the matter, uh, criticism of, uh, for example, Cezanne or uh, other late 19th century artists, is, is often the criticism that is most unfriendly, least least sympathetic, um, and that criticism which uh, offers too much respect doesn't really help us understand the, 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 the power uh, of, of the work. And in a way, something similar is happening here. The fact that this emperor felt the need to kind of tame this extraordinary painting by Dong Qichang is a sign of, of, of that power. Um, and he tamed it, or tried to tame it, of course he failed, um, not only through the inscriptions, but also as he did with all the paintings in his collection, through the, um, you can still hear me? Yeah, through the pattern of seals. And that's why I have an aerial view of the Forbidden City on the left. Um, the seals are put on in a particular order. You'll see that they're here, 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 down here, down here. I, I'm, I might be wrong about this, it's just a speculation and uh, peop other people will have other ideas. I've always felt that this pattern of seals was akin to a gateway, and that uh, an architectural gateway, and that it was a way of putting the paintings in the collection within the imperial precinct and uh, assert, you know, affirming uh, political power over them in a rather graphic way. Anyway, fortunately, we now have Photoshop. So we're going to be able to rather easily to take uh, the uh, inscriptions <laughs> away um, and, and see what the painting look, uh, is supposed to have looked like. Now, a much, so you, one does hear about that negative side of uh, imperial collecting, but a much more important uh, downside um, was the physical destruction of artworks. And here we, uh, there's one great source. In the book Li Dai Ming Hua Ji, the record of um, famous paintings of all the ages, or of successive ages, written by Zhang Yan Yuan in the middle of the ninth century, a long book, an extraordinary work of art history. And isn't it extra extraordinary that it predates Vasari by so many centuries? I mean, I know that not everything starts in China, but sometimes it feels that way. And in the Lida Ming Hua Ji, there's a chapter uh, called on the, on the Vicissitudes of the Art of Painting, which is ostensibly a history of imperial collections up to Zhang Yan Yuan's own time, the mid-ninth century. But it is actually an indictment of imperial collecting. Zhang notes that although existing imperial collections were regularly targeted for preservation as war booty by pretenders to the throne. In the chaos of war, works were often mistreated, lost, or abandoned on the road. And the first example that he gives us is the civil wars of the years 189 to 192, which is why I've, I have a, a map of the Han Empire in the second century AD. 
And the problem there was that uh, uh, when the capital was moved from Luoyang in the east um, to Chang'an in the west, um, many of the paintings uh, uh, were destroyed in, 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 in the process. He goes on to point out that palaces were often uh, burnt in their entirety or quasi-entirety quasi and that the storehouses of paintings, in which the storehouses in which the paintings were kept, were uh, destroyed. And that happened, he gives us examples of this. It happened in Luoyang um, in 311, uh, Luoyang. Perhaps, could you focus please? Um, it's, it's not quite uh, clear enough. Uh, where are we? Luoyang would be up here somewhere. There we go, Luoyang. Uh, and then again, down here in two, two other su southern cities, southern capitals, in the years 552 and 554. Do shout out if the, I can't tell if paintings are focused, so do shout out if they need focusing. Now, these two moments of palace destruction in the 310s and the 550s were particularly uh, devastating because those storehouses included many works that had been inherited from collections of earlier rulers and emperors. Um, after the second set of palace destructions and destructions of storehouses, in the 560s and the 570s, the emperors of the Qin Dynasty, and here I'm showing you uh, a painting at attributed to the Tang Dynasty, uh, a copy of, certainly at the very least, a, a copy of a Tang Dynasty painting, wonderful early work, uh, preserving a, a faithfully a Tang Dynasty composition, and showing two Qin Dynasty emperors. That collection that those emperors formed was then absorbed into the imperial collection of the Sui dynasty which uh, reunified China. And fortunately, it was uh, transported uh, safely to uh, Luoyang. Well, all imperial collections are provisional. Now I'm showing you another detail from the scroll. This is the Emperor Yangdi of the Sui. Yeah, the Emperor Yangdi, uh, unfortunately decided to transport this collection um, uh, which had come from the Qin emperors back to the south, to the city of Yangzhou. And uh, it uh, was transported by boat. There was a shipwreck and the collection was partly lost. Now, now I'm showing you the Tang uh, imperial city. Some of those paintings survived. Then there were others uh, still in uh, Luoyang in the north and others in Chang'an also in the north. And all of these together became the basis of the Tang Dynasty collection. Safe, you might think, but no. Because in 622, the Luoyang material was sent by boat to Chang'an and there was another shipwreck which decimated the collection. The core Tang Dynasty, and this is all from Zhang Yanyuan, the core Tang collection was then down to 300 scrolls in Chang'an, which had been inherited by the Tang dynasty from the, the, the preceding short-lived Sui dynasty. So no wonder that the Tang emperor Taizong, in the subsequent few decades of the first half of the 7th century, collected so intensively. Our mid-9th century guide, Zhang Yunyuan, concludes his sad litany with uh, the Anlu Shan Rebellion in the mid 8th century and the civil war at the end of the 8th century, which led to the further destruction of the Tang imperial collection. So this helps to explain why so few pre 9th century scroll paintings and screen paintings have survived today. If you've ever wondered why there are so few of them, um, this, this is part of the reason. And it also helps to explain why Song Dynasty emperors commissioned so many copies of uh, such works as uh, had survived. Now this is also, this question of the destruction of palaces and uh, 
the destruction of um, uh, you know the, the 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 destruction of collections that get moved about is also relevant to it's also relevant to later periods. Uh, I'm showing you an early 16th century painting on the left depicting the Forbidden City with uh, a man shown there who's thought to have been involved in the architectural uh, work. Uh, it's, a, it's actually a portrait of him. Um, at the end of the Ming Dynasty, that palace went up in flames. Uh, nowadays, when we look, when we go to the Forbidden City, we 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 often think we're still looking at a Ming Dynasty palace, but it has been rebuilt. It's in a new reincarnation. In 1644, it 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 was much of it was uh, burnt down, and presumably in that process, uh, many many paintings would would have been lost. And also, if we're talking about the physical destruction of artworks, we might think about the transfer of the formerly imperial collection or the certain parts of it to Taiwan. And of course, those objects were not destroyed, but still we could think about them in light of this long history of the um, contingencies of political events. Here I quote uh, Qin Xiaoyi, a former director of the National Palace Museum. In he, he summarizes the history. In anticipation of the impending invasion by the Japanese militarists following the Mukden incident of 1931, the late President Chiang Kai-shek resolved to protect the cultural heritage represented by the museum's collections by moving them from Beiping, that's Peking, southward to Safe Haven. After a journey of nearly 7,500 miles and untold hardships, the collections arrived safely in southwest China. Shortly after resettling the collections in Nanking, following the Sino-Japanese War, they were again forced to move in the wake of yet another war, this time eastward across the Straits to the island of Taiwan. No other collection of art has ever traveled so far and for so long. Well, arguably hindsight, but of course hindsight is 2020. Uh, but still, hindsight demonstrates that the two-stage move of the collection actually placed it at greater risk than if it had been left in Beijing. And if one has to ask what role the age-old function of such collections played, uh, the, the, what role the age-old function of such collections as cultural and, and political capital played in exposing these paintings to risk or these artworks to risk, um, I mean, there's something, uh, you know, it's just something that we, we, we have to think about. This is not to criticize those involved in the move at all, such as Ye Gong Chuo, whose motives were, of course, entirely honorable, but simply to point out that when artworks entered an imperial collection, then their destiny became subject to the, con the particular contingencies of political power. Qin Xiaoyi's uh, uh, statement, which I've just read out to you, for me is very interestingly reflective. It's not at all a, a, a trumpeting of a, um, a great success. It's, a, it's a, an almost bittersweet um, uh, summary of what happened. And I, I hear in it a subtle awareness of the fragility of the collection's survival. Now here we might um, think about another of Max Ye's very subtle insights, that collections in China have often been put together against something else, against dispersion. And he, he talks in his essay about Shidaifo collections, literati collections, where uh, family collections, where the, the problem is the dispersion of the family itself, the dispersion also of the breakup of the collection as it's the, uh, uh, in the course of in inheritance and so on, which gives more meaning to the, the collection uh, when it is together. But I think that this argument can perhaps be extended beyond Shadaifo collections and literati collections to the imperial uh, collecting of paintings, because after all, dynasties always fall, and there's a, a, 
it's very hard for even for the emperors to keep all the paintings together during the time that the dynasty is in existence. Now, before I talk about why it's so difficult for them to do it, let me at least um, talk about the, uh, to, for, talk very briefly about their um, success in keeping paintings out of circulation, which was much commented on by the scholar elite. The, sequ their, the sequestering of paintings by the imperial court. Zhang Yanyuan in the mid 9th century was one of the first to talk about this. He had personal experience. In the year 818, his family had been forced to present major works to the emperor. And this is what he says. The works of calligraphy and the paintings were all received into the inner storehouse of the palace and the world has seen no more of them. There's several points to make here. I mean, first of all, in the year 818, the emperor of the day was undoubtedly trying to make up for uh, recent, recent destruction of the imperial collection. Secondly, Zhang Yuan has his own ax to grind. This, uh, there's, there is this contest between the emperors and the, uh, the, the scholarly elite uh, to... Um, to bring paintings into their own hands. And then thirdly, we would have to say that the elite were not uh, blameless um, when it came to the sequestering of works of art. The ultimate sequestering of an artwork is to take it with you when you go, to put it in your tomb. And we know that, the, uh, th that people did this. <laughs> uh, in fact, some of the most important paintings that we know about today, most important for writing a history of Chinese painting, have actually come from tombs, such as these two paintings which were uh, found in a mid to late uh, 10th century Liao Dynasty tomb, and which probably date, in my opinion, from slightly earlier in, 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 in the 10th century. They were antiques, I think, when they were put in that collection. They're anonymous paintings. Or there's this extraordinary painting, never, unfortunately, not discussed as much as it should be, attributed to uh, the artist Jing Hao, working at the very end of the 9th century and very, very beginning of the 10th, uh, which is in the Nelson Atkins Gallery in uh, Kansas City, which reputedly was excavated from a tomb. And another major, major work of art, which uh, which you maybe not immediately recognize uh, because I'm showing just the very beginning and the very end, Huang Gong Wang's Dwelling in the Fuchun Mountains, great 14th century masterpiece, painted, as he says here, over three years. But the it starts very oddly at the beginning, and this is because it was uh, saved from a fire because that uh, uh, 17th century owner apparently wanted to uh, take it with him. There are examples of emperors who wanted to take things with them. The most famous is, again, the Emperor Taizong of the Tang Dynasty, who took with him the, uh, the, the manuscript, the original manuscript by Wang Xizhi of the, the, the fourth century calligrapher Wang Xizhi, patriarch of the, the calligraphic tradition, his um, preface to the Lantin gathering. But most of the examples are actually uh, those of private, uh, private owners. The, the contest between the emperors and the scholar, the elite in collecting, might also be seen in the phenomenon of the duplicitous curator, what I would call the, that's what I would like to call these people. One is, uh, I think, is uh, Se, represented here by one of his bamboo paintings, um, rather dull bamboo paintings I've always felt. He lived from 1290 to 1343, and he oversaw the, the, the Mongol imperial collection in Dadu, that's Beijing, from 1328 to 1332. Now, his um, seals are to be found on a number of paintings, including the river bank. I'm sorry, I don't have a color picture of that wonderful 10th, 11th century painting, in case you're wondering what I think about the authenticity of that painting. Uh, now in the Metropolitan Museum, and on Yang Wujiu's Yang Wujiu's beautiful uh, 
Prinus Blossom painting of 1165. I have a feeling that Kujos uh, um, kept paintings out of imperial hands on the model of a later, uh, I don't have enough evidence to be absolutely certain about it, but it, I'm thinking of the model of a later curator who was definitely duplicitous from the uh, period of the Kangxi Emperor. Here we see the Kangxi Emperor as a young man and then as a, a ma mature uh, individual. And I'm talking here about uh, Gao Shiqi, who lived from 1645 to 1704, and who has left a catalog of his collection, the Jiangsun Shu Hua Mu, which has a separate section listing works that he transmitted to the court with comments that make it clear that most of those works are copies or fakes. Whereas we know from several works now in, uh, in American collections and from other parts of his catalog that he owned great early works. I mean, this early Ming painting on the left, of just a detail um, by Qin Ru Yan and uh, from 1301, Xin Yu Shu's uh, Song, of the Stone, uh, Song of the Stone Drums. Um, and both of these paintings escaped the long arm of the Qianlong Emperor as well. Um, you know, somebody like Gao Shiqi certainly had a selfish motive, perhaps uh, Ke Zhou Se as well, but perhaps this was also a principled action. He, could, he couldn't know about Qianlong and how rapacious Qianlong's collection would, uh, collecting activities would be, but he did know that some works had been sequestered for several centuries in imperial collections before his, uh, his own time. And that's why now I'm a, a detail of a building from the Forbidden City, as you know. And on the right, uh, this is known as the Ming Half Seal. It's an inventory seal that records the entry, that was used to record the entry of works into the, uh, uh, the uh, imperial collection at the big beginning of the Ming Dynasty. And it's one of the tools that we have for tracing the, the, the histories, the biographies of artworks. And it allows us to, um, to, to work out that certain paintings did stay in imperial collections for a very, uh, for a very long time. Um, and here we could, uh, I mean, we know, um, for example, you know, if we just think of this in an abstract way for the moment, just to be more graphic, um, when the, the Jurchens uh, invaded Kaifeng and set up the Jin Dynasty, they got hold of uh, Huizong's uh, Song uh, collection. Um, the paintings that they didn't sell off uh, and which stayed in their imperial collection, then many of them found their way into the Yuan imperial collection. Meantime, the Mongols had also inherited much of this, the Song Imperial, the Southern Song Imperial collection, and then paintings from the Yuan Imperial collection found their way into the Ming with that seal on the right on them. After Gao Shiqi's time, in the time of Qianlong, uh, imperial collecting became far more intensive, and there was great pressure on officials around the country to uh, send paintings in, uh, pressure on uh, individual collectors to seed paintings to the court in the same way uh, as had been done uh, a long time before uh, in, the in the Tang Dynasty. And we even have paintings at this time by artists like Jin Nong. He's the most famous. Jin Nong did a whole series of memory reconstructions of paintings like this one. This is a memory reconstruction of a 12th century painting. And on, in his inscription, he tells us that uh, this, he had once had jade rollers made for this painting when it was owned by a friend of his. After that friend had died, it had been sold to another person. That person became one of the curators of the Qianlong Imperial Collection and gave the painting to the Imperial Collection. And so it could no longer be seen by the, the scholar elite. Um, but Jin Nong, uh, painted it from memory. In fact, he painted this uh, image ob obsessively. Um, now, I'm moving toward the end here, and I don't have long to, don't have long to go. Despite the uh, critiques by the uh, 
a, the scholarly, a scholarly elite and their vision of the imperial collection as a kind of tomb. In fact, the imperial collection was often something of a revolving door, a site through which paintings pass temporarily. If collecting is done in the face of dispersion, um, that insight of Max Yez is confirmed by the multiple ways in which imperial collections proved unstable or porous. And this happened, first of all, through gifting. Um, gifts were made by emperors to princes, members of the nobility, favored officials, eunuchs, even hermits. The emperor with whom we started, Jin Zong, once gave 40 paintings and calligraphies to a single hermit of the time. This was just a minor example of the use of gifts in the exercise of power in China to create loyalty. But as far as uh, the history of painting goes, it was a major phenomenon affecting their circulation and transmission. Uh, we have many famous examples. Um, uh, a, whole palace full, a whole palace full of paintings by Guo Xi that were given to a man who was then in charge of repairs to the palace. Um, uh, the son of the founder of the Ming Dynasty, who was given a whole pile of uh, paintings and calligraphies, including the painting on the right uh, uh, by Guan Tung, one of the wonderful early uh, paint landscape paintings from the Northern Song, probably, uh, well, five dynasties or Northern Song period. Um, and uh, a painting in the National, that's in the National Palace Museum, so too is the painting on the left by Ni Zan, the 14th century artist, his wonderful Rongxi studio, which bears seals of a Manchu aristocrat of the late 17th century, to whom the painting was once gifted by the emperor. There was also an economic dimension to gifting. The emperor's agents were sometimes paid in this way. We know that uh, one 10th century imperial agent found a thousand paintings for the emperor, and he kept a hundred for himself. <laughs> and back in the 8th century, after the Anlushan Rebellion, um, the Emperor Suzong uh, gave paintings to imperial fam family members to sell, presumably because they didn't have much uh, money in the imperial treasury. And much later in the Ming Dynasty, I mean, we know that paintings were sold off by the Jin Dynasty, by the Yuan government. And here I'm showing you a picture of the art and antique market at the rear of the Forbidden City, a Ming painting. And it's thought that paintings were also sold there. Um, a third way in which paintings found a way out of imperial collections was through theft, often by mounters or people in charge of mounting. Uh, this again goes back to the, 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 the Tang, uh, I mean, I have several stories. Like, um, um, there's very little time. Let me just give you one. Uh, Joe Mi, writing in the late 13th century, recounts that he had the opportunity to visit the Song Imperial Storehouse on the eve of the dynasty's fall. And he says, quote, although security is extremely strict, fakes have often been substituted for genuine works, and they are extremely difficult to distinguish. Um, this man on the left, the Emperor Taizou, the, the founder of the Song, acquired 50-odd paintings from the Southern Tang collection. Uh, a few decades later, only three were left. This painting on the right, a detail from the great Qingming Festival scroll, um, bears a colophon which explains that it had once been in an imperial collection but had been taken out by a mounter who had substituted uh, uh, a copy and then the original was sold to a higher official. To conclude, <laughs> the Qing imperial collection, uh, although affected by clandestine deaccessioning at the end of the dynasty, passed in large measure into the hands of the Republic, and the two imperial palaces of Beijing and Xinjiang were turned into modern museums. Eventually, as is well known, and as I've been talking about, the palace museum, the palace museum collection came to be split between Beijing and Taipei. More generally, museums play the role today that imperial and princely collections played in the past. However, modern museums, of course, are, are neither tombs nor revolving doors in the manner of the imperial collections at different moments of their history because public exhibitions, catalog reproductions, and now the internet 
have made possible a new form of circulation of the artwork. So my brief discussion today is not meant as an argument that paintings should be kept out of museums. <laughs> Um, far from it. Um, uh, for in the modern situation, the problem of the sequestered, unavailable artwork has largely been solved, and the audience uh, that gets access to paintings is in to these huge uh, collections, important collections, is really much larger. It's an occasion for celebration when a collection like the Ye family collection enters a museum. There is, however, the problem, of course, in our contemporary world of security. This is something I think about and every time I enter the Metropolitan Museum, which is every week, and uh, have to go through security. They, they don't have a security check if they think that nobody would ever blow up a museum, which, of course, would destroy the paintings in it, which is what I really, uh, really worry about. I end with a painting on the right, which I believe dates from uh, 1919, um, it shows uh, an exhibition, um, a fundraising exhibition for the victims of flooding. And for this exhibition, uh, collectors in Beijing, important collectors in Beijing, brought out their artworks and put them on public view. Uh, there was a ticket to pay, and that's how the, the, the money was raised. They were on uh, view for seven, for seven days. This is one of the first public exhibitions of painting in China. It's an early example of the modern practice of taking private collections and making them available to the rest of us. And that's the tradition that is being continued today. You might note among the collectors mentioned up here, the first one on the list is a Mr. Ye. Um, I can't, it, it's, it's a Mr. Ye Yu Fu. I don't know if this is Ye Gong Tuo or if this is indeed a member of the Ye family. I just suspect that it is. At any rate, it's a great tradition to which the Ye family uh, has contributed with this gift. Thank you very much. So there is, the reception is upstairs on the second floor. Uh, a couple more thank yous to Pauline Yao, who's the assistant curator of Chinese art at the Asian Art Museum, and Kaya Surt, who actually worked so hard to put all of this together, and we'll thank them again tomorrow, and Wen Shinye, who's my partner in this whole project, and I hope to see you all tomorrow. Again, their reception is on the second floor. Thank you. Mm -hmm.